Timothy 3.16. So if you want to turn to that. 2 Timothy 3.16. 2 Timothy being the last book that Paul wrote and probably, um, probably the last book written in the Bible. Although some people, some folks, uh, some folks uh, think it's the book of Revelation and it's not. Revelation is nowhere near the traditional date uh, that it was written at all. But anyway, that's a whole other conversation. 2 Timothy 3.16. And it was one of the memory verses. <clears throat> um, and I kind of just getting right into it. I'm sorry, folks. I just getting right into it because I wanted to deal with this, okay? Uh, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. The importance of this verse is that all scripture is given by, not is, but one of the important points in this verse is all scripture is given by inspiration of God. And what I did last week is I explained that inspiration. If you go over to uh, 2 Peter... I think it's 2 Peter 1, 20. Thank you. 2 Peter 1, 20. And it just gives an explanation of the issue of inspiration. And the reason I want to focus on this a little bit is that it is not uh, inspiration in, in, the, in the respect of like a... a uh, a musician is inspired to write a song. It's not inspiration in regards to they heard the word of the Lord and they were inspired to write the message that they got. It is not inspiration uh, because that's a new kind of trend that you've got. They've even got a translation now that they call the message. If you want to read a piece of trash, I know that I, I'm being kind of... Uh, I'm being kind of, I'm being serious. Read that. But don't dare call it the Bible. It has no, it is a, it, it is a cartoon book without the cartoon characters. That's all. It's just a complete junk. But, and, and I'm sorry if I, I come off sounding a little harsh on that. And let me, let me explain why I'm saying that. The Word of God is the absolute plenary authority for us as believers. We have to be able to trust what we're looking at. There is so much junk out there that is that that says it's it's the the Bible that that says this is and and the idea is that well if I just get the gist of it. So if you get that book. I won't call it the Bible, call it the message. Um, that's basically the idea, is they're saying, well, this is the gist. You see, that's not what's being talked about here in inspiration, okay? It's not the gist of it. So if you take a look at first, uh, 2 Peter 1.20, knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture, and I explained this last week, prophecy, what is prophecy? Can someone loudly tell me what they think prophecy is? Did everyone have their coffee before they came? The spoken word of God? The, by very the well said. The spoken word of God. Most people would think it to be what? Foretelling. 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 Prophecy. A prophecy of the future, right? But what did a prophet do? They spoke. They spoke for God. For on God, of God. Right? Yeah. They spoke on behalf of God. When you talk about prophecy, you talk about a prophet was a man who spoke on behalf of God. So if he spoke on behalf of God, is he speaking God's word? Mm -hmm. Yes, that's the answer. That's the whole point. Okay. Now, you note, and I said before that Revelation, now hold your hand there. We're going to go somewhere else real quick. And go to uh, the end of, of the book, of the Bible here in Revelation. Revelation chapter. No. Well, 
chapter 22 and jump down to uh, verse 18, please. So verse 18, sorry, I, I hadn't written this down, so I'm just kind of going by my memory. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of, this, of the prophecy of this book. So here's where some people, well, isn't, isn't Revelation a book of a foretelling book? Yes, it is. Um, but what you, we have to understand is where the book of Revelation is, okay? It's the last book in the Bible. It's there for a purpose. The Holy Spirit has put it there, caused it, inspired men to say this is where the book belongs, okay? Now, keep going. For I testify to every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add to these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of this book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. The book of life, when we trust Christ as Savior, uh, our name is written down. We're, we're saved. Okay? Here's, here's the kicker. Um, if you take away from the book, what are you going to lose? Very likely the message of salvation. So if you lose the message of salvation, what do you get? The punishments okay, of the book. The, what I'm getting at is, Revelation is saying that as a bookend note, and it's saying it in reference to the entire prophetic scripture. You follow? Right? It's not saying that just about itself. It's saying that about the whole book. Go back to 2 Peter. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. Um, many folks say that, that people have, have messed with the Scripture. They have, they have, they have changed it. They have, uh, it, it's been, it's, it's corrupted. Of course, that is the idea behind all the, the new translations, isn't it? If you, if you take that, that paper that you have there on the Alexandrian text versus the received text, you'll see that the whole point of the Alexandrian text was they were trying to find the oldest documents because the idea was, well, God couldn't preserve his word, which is arrogant of any man to say. If God couldn't preserve his word, how is it that when you die, he's going to raise you up? from the grave into heaven. He's a pretty powerless God if he can't even preserve his own word. So, but that's the idea, and so what happens is that they say that um, they've got to look for other, uh, other copies and so on and so forth, okay? So knowing this first, that, that no prophecy of scripture is, is of any private interpretation. The issue there is, it's not the gist. It's not someone who, I, had a, I was in a trance, God spoke to me, and I believe this is the message I got. Okay? How do I know that? Next verse. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but by holy men of God, by, by, by holy men of God spake as they were, now look at that word, moved by the Holy Ghost. A musician gets an idea. He's inspired to write a song. He gets a, and he adds to it, and he modifies it, and he changes it, and then he's inspired, and he gets this song. That's not the kind of inspiration here. We're talking about God moving holy men of old that he chose, and he literally, the Holy Spirit, literally write this word. Why is, excuse me, that important? Well, that's important because then there can only be one true word. Okay? So the issue of the Alexandrian texts, and I am covering a little bit of different information here, but it bears on what we're going to look at in 2 Timothy 3, 16 here. Um, the issue of the Alexandrian text is you have 45 texts that are highly edited and none agree with each other 100%.
what's the problem if you look at this verse with that concept? Problem is, which one did the Holy Ghost move him to write? Now, if the text is highly edited, what else does that tell you? Things are added or removed. There you go. Which, which goes back to Revelation chapter 22. Okay, 18 and 19. And it says there's a warning there. So, God help the men that did that. And, and he's not going to. He just said, if you, if you do, you're in trouble. But, but the point is that, that there is one word. Okay? And we're not going to get into the doctrine of preservation, but if there is one word, then we know that we have to find it. Um, if you have the King James Version, you do have the verses in the Doctrine of Pre Preservation. If you have any of the Alexandrian text versions, that is any of the, and when I say versions, understand I'm talking about the English version, okay? I am not talking about other translations in other languages, okay? I have not found one translation in the French language based on the received text that the King James Version is. Okay, so I can't recommend any of them. Um, Spanish, some folks have tried to do, uh, have tried to, to, to uh, do some, some decent translations. I can't, I can't say 100%, there seems to be, uh, I, I don't speak fluent Spanish, so it would be, it's not my place to say. Uh, some Spanish folks prefer the older um, René Valerian. Uh, some folks uh, like the Gomez version. I've, I've looked at the Go Gomez version. It's, it's, it's pretty good, but like I said, I'm not fluent in that language. Um, but as far as French, there is none. So I I if you're listening to this and you have a French translation, uh, please go and to the English KJV or you know, find something based on the received text. Um, so the received text has over 5,500 copies. Of course they're worn, they're torn, they're tattered, but guess what? Those 5,500 copies, they all agree with each other virtually to 100%. Okay? What's that tell you? Someone's preserving something, right? And believe me, looking through history, uh, the Orthodox movement tried to destroy it many times. Killed, burned, tortured folks to try to get rid of the received text. So the fact that there's 5,500 copies is amazing. 2 Timothy 3.16. So the subject that we have here is, and do we have audio there, Evan? We're good on that? Okay. The subject that we're talking about here is Paul's secret Bible code. That's what we're calling it. Everyone heard of Bible code? It's okay. You're not missing anything. But Paul has a secret Bible code. Did you know that? No. Well, you did. You were here last week, so. Take a look at 2 Timothy 3.16. All scripture is given by inspiration. We've established what they, that inspiration is. And it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished on all good works. So did you catch the secret code? Missed it? Want to read it again? Look at this. It is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction. Why? For instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect. Do you know, what's the first word there in that list? It's profitable for? Doctrine. Doctrine. What is the first book in Paul's canonized, the order, the canonized scriptures that Paul wrote? Romans. Not the first book that he wrote. Romans. Do you know that Romans is a book of doctrine. doctrine? Okay, what's the next two books? Corinthians. Corinthians. Reproof. Do you know that they're reproof? Yeah. 
What's the next book? Galatians. You know what that is? Correct. Book of Correction. What's the book after Galatians? What? Ephesians. Do you know what that book is? Doctrine. And what's after Ephesians? Philippians. What was that? It's a book of reproof. What is the next book after? Colossians. That's a book of correction. See what I'm doing? Now, we can, that's Paul's secret code. He had a formula. The formula is important. Remember it. Because that's how you deal with your personal Christian growth. It was put there by the Holy Spirit, not in, 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 in chronological order, those books. In fact, probably the first books written somewhere between Galatians or, or, or Thessalonians. Okay? Um, one of those books. And tradition is not right all the time. It's rarely ever right, personally. That's what I feel. But um, it's not right all the time on these on these dates, okay? I found several errors that just, anyway, we're not going to get into that tonight. But the point is, you see the pattern. That's Paul's secret code. Now, after I get all my doctrine, reproof, correction, doctrine, reproof, correction, doctrine, reproof, correction, and I'm going up, as I go, we always start at the book of what? Romans. Why don't we start at John? I know that there's a lot of denominationalists out there that just like, why don't you start at John? Because John has nothing to do with you. You can't even be saved by reading the book of John. I know people of You can't. Required to be saved, you have to trust in something. And what is it that we have to trust for the salvation message? There is only one salvation message in work today, right? And what is that? You believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, right? You trust his finished work on the cross, you do it. If you read John 3.16, is Christ dead, buried, and resurrected by John 3? How is it that you're going to be saved and he didn't even die yet? You see, this is why Paul said that he was preaching the cross. Right? It's the preaching of the cross. Which to the Jews were what? Foolishness. No, to the Greeks it was a foolishness. To Israel it was a stumbling stone. Okay? Why? Because they had killed their Messiah. But what did I, what was the last word? Messiah. Okay? So the point of when you go through Romans, you go through doctrine, then you go through 1st and 2nd Corinthians, you're going into reproof, you go into Galatians, you go into correction, da 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 Then after you do all those books, we start into what would they be called? Epistles. The what? Epistles. Oh, they're all epistles. They're instruction to the church, leadership, administration. So the they would be called the what? Pastoral epistles. Okay, let's read that verse again here. All scripture is given by inspiration of God is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, right? What does the pastor have to be? Verse 17. That the man of God may be perfect, that is mature. You don't want an immature pastor, do you? You've seen those guys. Mm -hmm. Truly furnished unto... All good works. There's your pastoral epistles. You see, there's a function and a secret code that Paul has put in there. And he goes, this is my formula. And this is where you end up. Okay? It doesn't mean that you have to be a pastor in the end. What it means is that you have to be a man of God. Mature, perfect, truly furnished. By the way, in the new translations, they'll say thoroughly. Why is that wrong? Anybody got a guess? Why does the KJV here use truly? Anybody have an idea? It's through you. Yeah. Not thoroughly. So the thoroughly is you kind of soaked in it. You've been baptized in it. 
but truly is something that happens from the inner man outwards, right? So we're to be renewed daily in the inner man, in our mind. Why? Because the battleground in this life, folks, is not you against another believer, against the non-Christians, against the politicians. That's not the battle. And you all know that I have some pretty strong feelings on political things. That's fine. I don't hide that. But I'm not so blind as to think that it has any real bearing on what's on the church growth. Or, you know, it, it has some bearing on what we're freedoms we have. But it has, doesn't have bearing on the gospel or we're not trying to change the world. or you know, We're not trying to bring the law and the Ten Commandments up. So that's... That, that's not that's not what's going on there. But and I lost my train of thought where I was going with it. I apologize. Um, but the, the the issue here is that the word of God works through you and works through the battlefield is your mind, the inner man. Okay, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Please remember that. You're not trying. It is not, and I'm going to say this, it is not me against somebody else. I don't care if he's whatever denomination you choose. That's not, most people in denominations, just like many of you, were lost in a misunderstanding. The only way we as grace believers a function is to show grace working through our life. That's why it has to work through us and out. We're going to go a lot more into that in, in, in Romans chapter 12 when we get down to that area and you start to see how a mature Christian starts to work. And we're getting, we're almost getting through here uh, all, all of the basic doctrines and then of course when we what we have to do, of course, afterwards, because of that secret code that I was talking about there, is Paul says, you're going to get doctrine. What do I need to do after? I need to correct you. You're going to have some, some wrong information. You're going to operate incorrectly. Okay? And you're going to get that, and then all of a sudden, you're going to need to be reproved because you're going to start to... Um, dare I use the term backslide in different things and misunderstand and that's why I spent so much time going through these these uh, last few chapters and spending a lot of time in Romans 7 because I want you to be strong in not backsliding into that legalistic mentality right but when we approach people what we need to do is approach them with that doctrine working through understanding, patient. Why? You notice that that the end there is you're truly furnished unto all good works. Right? That's the issue. Okay? So there's a function of the secret code that's going to get you to where you need to be. Right? So that's the secret code.